Amen. Uh, on West Campus and on East Campus, uh, can, we, can we give a hand once again for our bands that have been leading us so well? Thank you uh, for doing that this year. And um, can I also ask you to give a round of applause for yourself? It's Dead Week, y'all. You are here. I know there's more to come, but, you know, it's exciting. Um, so, some reminders. This is also the last week of chapel and class and so many other things. So tonight is the final, I'm going to say the word last or final a lot here, the last senior chapel is tonight. Seniors, come on, we got to keep cheering for you as much as we can. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Wednesday morning, East and West Campus will be relatively normal. And Wednesday evening, something exciting, outdoor Kaleo, which is, out, it's Kaleo, but it's outdoors. That's why it's called Outdoor Kaleo. It's on the DRC, I think they call it. Uh, also, baptisms will happen right after that. If you are interested in possibly being baptized, you can sign up still today in the campus pastor's office. Thursday night is the last evening prayers, and then Friday we have what we like to call our Yes Chapel. Year-end surprise is what it stands for, but we should really call every chapel Yes Chapel because here we are. Um, and that is, by the way, live only in the Felix Event Center right here. There will be no chapel on East Campus on Friday, and that, my friends will have been the semester in chapel. Fun stuff. Today, however, uh, we have what we like to call our last lecture series. Now, here's the thing. Calling something that happens twice a year is definitely stretching the definition of series, but go with it. So, uh, we, we've set aside two chapels this year. Uh, one, the last, or the last week, rather, of fall, and here the last week of spring, to invite APU faculty to speak in chapel based on student recommendations. That's you. Uh, so, what we do is we ask faculty members to come to share a message based on this question. If you were to give one last message to our undergraduate students, what would it be? Hence the name, Last Lecture Series. So, Dr. Steve Mann serves as, so you know him, uh, serves as an assistant professor in the Department of Biblical and Theological Studies here at APU. He is an alum of APU where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in music education as well as a master of divinity before completing a PhD at Fuller Theological Seminary. So on a personal note, uh, I actually have known Steve for uh, quite some time. Our houses growing up were five minutes apart maybe, I think. No kidding. Uh, I'm told, so every once in a while I'll have a student come up to me and say, hey, my professor babysat you before. And I'm like, oh, you have a class with Steve. So this, this happened, uh, and I can confirm here once and for all that, yes, the rumors are true. Uh, he did, in fact, serve as a babysitter for my brothers and I on a few occasions. And this seems particularly critical for you to know. I can remember uh, that he and his brother were the first people to introduce me to Super Mario Brothers 3. I am eternally grateful. This is, again, important things, significant life moments. Uh, but seriously, uh, dating back to junior high and high school at summer camps and other places, I've had the privilege of benefiting from uh, his insight and knowledge at a number of points over the years, and it's really fun to get to see him do that here in the classroom at APU. So would you please join me in welcoming our speaker this morning, Dr. Steve Mann. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. It is true. And I, th I don't take that lightly, showing you the great Super Mario 3. Remind me to uh, show you Mario Kart 8 later. <laughs> well, I was surprised when the invitation came for me to speak with you today as an introvert, speaking in front of thousands of people and being recorded is way outside my comfort zone. I do, though, want to thank the students who nominated me <laughs> and to give a shout out to all my current and former students <laughs> and also to give a special shout out to all the introverts in the room. Don't worry, you don't have to shout out back. <laughs> now, I've been invited to speak out of my discipline, which is biblical studies, and specifically, thank you, and specifically the Old Testament. Yeah, that's about right. Sometimes Old Testament scholars must defend our choice of studying the First Testament as if it is no longer relevant. This is odd because Jesus specifically said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. The Greek word fulfill, plerao, indicates that Jesus fits perfectly 
with the Old Testament, or as the New Testament calls it, Scripture. So in order to understand Jesus, you need the Old Testament and vice versa. Similarly, Paul tells Timothy that from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. I'm sure you've heard that passage before, but note that the Scripture that Paul is talking about is not the New Testament, which had not been written yet. It's, it's the Old Testament. In my view, biblical studies is all about listening to the Bible. My Jedi master, John Golden Gay, offers two helpful questions to keep in mind when listening to a biblical text. Question one. How can we hear what these human authors were saying in God's name to their hearers? And two, how can we hear what God is saying to us through Scripture? The first question requires us to acknowledge that the Bible is not written as a modern text. As John Walton has said, the Bible was written for us, but not to us. There are ancient audiences for both the Old Testament and New Testament, and as my students know, I enjoy saying, as a good missionary, the Bible speaks to people about God in ways they understand. And we are listening in to what God said to them. The second question requires us to interact with other readers, especially those readers who have differing backgrounds and differing views from our own. As it turns out, we need to have conversations with others to best understand the Bible's conversational style. When Rachel Held Evans spoke at APU in 2013, she pointed out that the Bible attempts to open up conversations rather than to shut them down. So as a biblical studies person, I started the process of preparing today's last lecture message by looking for lectures in the Bible that might fit in such a series. There are many speeches in the Bible that qualify. I've decided to go with Joshua's last lecture found in Joshua chapter 24. First, in the book of Joshua, brief overview, we sometimes see Israel following God and we sometimes Israel, see Israel basically doing this, meh. So it's appropriate that the end of the book of Joshua contains a call. And so that's where we're going to jump in today. Chapter 24, verse 14, Joshua says, after recounting the relationship that God has with Israel, he says, now therefore reveal Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve Yahweh. Now, if you were unwilling to serve Yahweh, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living. But as for me and my household, we will serve Yahweh. And if you've ever taken a class with me, you know that when English translations have the Lord in all caps, I say Yahweh because that is what the Hebrew says, or that's our best guess as how to pronounce God's name. Going back to the passage in verse 16, then the people answered, far be it from us that we should forsake Yahweh to serve other gods. For it is Yahweh our God who brought us and our ancestors up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is my, my group speak here. <laughs> and who did these great signs in our sight. He protected us all along the way we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And Yahweh drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve Yahweh, for he is our God. Thank you. Thank you. Which is a good answer on their part. But Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve Yahweh, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. 
If you forsake Yahweh and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve Yahweh. <laughs> and, Yah and then Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen Yahweh to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. He said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you. Incline your hearts to Yahweh, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, Yahweh our God we will serve, and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. The part of Joshua's speech that we like, <laughs> you like that? is when Joshua says, choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. I remember that phrase when I was in youth group. It's a great call. The part I, I had never known about until I read the Bible is when Joshua tells Israel he won't forgive them if they follow other gods. And this is truly shocking. The dominant portrayal of God in the Old Testament is that he is loving and forgiving. In an alternate reality, Veggie Tales Joshua would be perplexed at what his counterpart, Biblical Joshua, has just said. Of course, our Christian impulse might be to suggest that Joshua says this because the Old Testament God is God of wrath and the New Testament God is God of love. I have two responses. One, they are the same God. And two, the New Testament doesn't try to distance itself from Joshua's words and even speaks in a similar way. Joshua tells Israel that if they, obey, if they disobey God, then God will consume them. In the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews, after celebrating Jesus as the mediator of the new covenant in chapter 12, does not go on to say, whew, so it's good news that we don't have to worry about God's judgment. We can live however we like. That was a close one. Instead, the message is, if Israel didn't get away with disobeying God, what makes us think we will get away with it? And then the writer of Hebrews affirms that indeed our God is a consuming fire. Jesus also speaks in ways that fit with Joshua. So Joshua tells Israel they cannot serve Yahweh and other gods. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, that no one can serve two masters, and that you cannot serve God and wealth. Similarly, Joshua tells Israel that God will not forgive their sins if they serve other gods. In Matthew 6, 14 to 15, Jesus says that God will not forgive your trespasses if you don't forgive each other. So what is Joshua doing in his last lecture to Israel? And how might the Holy Spirit seek to use this text to transform our thinking to be more like Jesus? First, Joshua tells Israel that they cannot follow Yahweh and the gods of their past or present culture. Following Yahweh is nothing like following the gods of the Canaanites. To serve the gods of the ancient Near East basically meant giving them tithes and offerings and taking care of their places of worship. On the contrary, the Torah and prophets say that to serve Yahweh means to live for God by taking care of the poor and the least of these, the orphan, the widow, and the immigrant. It means insisting upon the community acting with justice and righteousness. For example, Micah 6 asks, with what shall I come before Yahweh and bow myself before God on high, shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will Yahweh be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then Micah provides the answer. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does Yahweh require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? 
You may not think that you are tempted to follow other gods, but the mindset behind Canaanite religion should sound familiar. Walter Brueggemann points out that, quote, Canaanite religion, I'm doing my Walter Brueggemann right now. It's not perfect. I'm working on it. Canaanite religion is essentially a metaphor for trying to have life on your own terms and to produce your own well-being and your own security by your own self-sufficiency. Essentially, you convince the gods to bless you by giving them what they want, tithes and offerings. Then you live as you like and hopefully the gods bless your efforts. That's why you sacrifice to as many gods as you possibly can greater chances you have of one of them blessing you. Following Yahweh means only worshiping Yahweh and specifically living for Yahweh with everything that you have. Serving Yahweh means to deny yourself and serve God. We might say to do unto others as God has done for you. In Canaanite religion, you assume the gods exist to help you succeed. A modern depiction of such an idea is religious consumerism. In their 2011 book, Renovation of the Church, Kent Carlson and Mike Lucan quote from Eugene Peterson, now I'm there, who says, if we are a nation of consumers, obviously the quickest and most effective way to get them into our congregation is to identify what they want and offer it to them. Satisfy their fantasies, promise them the moon, recast the gospel in consumer terms. Entertainment, satisfaction, excitement, adventure, problem solving, whatever. This is the language we Americans grow up on, the language we understand. We are the world's champion consumers, so why shouldn't we have state-of-the-art consumer churches? There is only one thing wrong, This is not the way in which God brings us into conformity with the life of Jesus and sets us on the way of Jesus' salvation. This is not the way in which we become less and Jesus becomes more. This is not the way in which our sacrificed lives become available to others in justice and service. The cultivation of consumer spirituality is the antithesis of a sacrificial, deny yourself congregation. A consumer church is an antichrist church. I want to take that mic out and then just drop it. But I won't because I didn't ask. (laughs) Rachel Held Evans makes a similar point when she speaks about millennials leaving the church in her 2015 book, Searching for Sunday. We millennials have been advertised to our entire lives so we can smell BS from a mile away. The church is the last place we want to be sold another product, the last place we want to be entertained. Millennials aren't looking for a hipper Christianity, we're looking for a truer Christianity, a more authentic Christianity. Like every generation before ours and every generation after, we're looking for Jesus, the same Jesus who can be found in the strange places he's always been found, in bread, in wine, in baptism, in the word, in suffering, in community, and among the least of these. We cannot serve consumerism and the God of the Bible. And when we try to do so, we are serving ourselves and not God. The second thing Joshua does is to make sure that Israel knows what they are doing by choosing Yahweh. After his audience says that they choose to serve Yahweh, Joshua says they cannot serve Yahweh and that he will not forgive their transgressions or their sins if they follow other gods. For us, this is sort of like persuading someone to give their life to Jesus. And when they say they are ready for Jesus, you say, you can't give your life to Jesus. You can't handle Jesus. That's really a movie reference for your parents. We need to think about the reason for why Joshua issues his shocking statement. On the surface, what Joshua does here, it does contradict other passages and what he says about God's forgiveness. But this divinely inspired contradiction 
functions to persuade God's people to serve Yahweh and not the false gods. It is a challenge to take God seriously, which for some reason God's people usually have a hard time doing. This is how Joshua's audience takes it. They take it as a challenge. They don't say, aw, shucks, sounded too good to be true. No, they say, no, we will serve Yahweh. (sighs) And then Joshua tells them they are witnesses, and then he makes a covenant with them. When I was a youth pastor for seven long, wonderful years, and seven's a good biblical number, so I figured I had done my time after seven. Most youth pastors only go three. Some go 40. And the next is 144,000. So you got to use biblical numbers for your time in ministry. I realized then that we Christians sometimes present Christianity as a sort of bait and switch. We sell Christianity in glowing terms as a get out of hell free card and only later talk about denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus. One time I took my youth group to Mexicali with Azusa Pacific University. And one of my students pulled me aside in the middle of the week. This student had been coming to the youth group with his friend and had prayed to receive Christ about a month before. This was his first missions trip. Let's call him Bruce. (laughs) Bruce told me he no longer wanted to be a Christian. Now at the time, as I was listening to him, I was thinking, too late, buddy, you prayed the prayer, I'll see you in heaven whether you like it or not. I was so pleased with myself. (laughs) But now I think Bruce had not previously decided if he was going to be a Christian, even though he had recited the words of the sinner's prayer. And to his credit, he had come to the conclusion that being a Christian meant he couldn't live for himself. And he wanted to live life on his own terms. Bruce understood this aspect of Christianity better than many, even most, Christians. You can't incorporate Jesus into your life. To follow Jesus means that Jesus becomes your life. There is something else about this text that makes it appropriate for me to preach from today. Joshua is not explaining the decision to follow Yahweh for people who have never heard of Yahweh. Joshua is speaking to people who already, already identify as God's people. He is not saying anything new. He is challenging them to live for God and reminding them of what they already know, or they already should know, that they cannot merely incorporate Yahweh into their lives in the promised land. So if this really is the last time that I give a lecture, I must take this moment to say just two things to you, my beloved APU students. First, I challenge you to follow God in the ways in which the Bible describes following God. Listen to Moses when he says to love orphans, widows, and immigrants. Listen to prophets such as Amos and Micah as they plead for God's people to love the poor and needy in specific and tangible ways, such as providing food and shelter and by working for justice for these groups in the courts. Pay attention to Isaiah inviting eunuchs and other outsiders into a relationship with the God who gathers all outcasts. Listen to Jesus when he speaks of visiting incarcerated people and loving our enemies. I love Walter Brueggemann's description of God's people, so here he's back, he's back, when he says, recipients of God's grace are massively inclusive of others who are welcomed as neighbors in the presence of God. (laughs) I'm gonna read that again in his voice. Recipients of God's grace are massively inclusive of others who are welcomed as neighbors in the presence of God. This sort of sacrificial neighborliness is dangerous, countercultural, and counterintuitive. Perhaps that is why ancient Israel failed to do it. And perhaps that is why so few Christians even try. We tend to act more like Canaanites than Christians, and we don't even know it. We serve ourselves. We fight for our rights instead of laying them down as Jesus did. We believe that God works for us so that we can be comfortable. In particular, 
I believe that the church must do a better job of loving immigrants, and we must start loving LGBTQ people. Those are two things we need to work on. There's other blind spots. It isn't that outsiders are merely invited into the kingdom of God. It's that outsiders are central in the kingdom of God. So with God's help, we must stop viewing our neighbors as a threat to our security and start to see them as humans who are made in the image of God, people whom God so loves. Now my second challenge may be more difficult. I hope that when you leave the APU bubble, you will become involved in your local church. I know the church isn't perfect. It is almost as if every church constantly needs to be reminded that they need to choose to follow God, to put God first, to follow only God. Perhaps Joshua's last lecture is a call for each of us to follow Joshua's lead and point God's people back to God. I would like to close with a prayer that Pastor David Penn offered a few years ago at Hesperia Church of the Nazarene. I won't pray it in his voice because that, that would be weird. <laughs> Let's pray. It is the desire of our hearts to follow you, Jesus, to go where you go, to live where you live, to serve where you serve, to be where you are. And we confess this morning that sometimes we get distracted doing our own things, going our own way, living within our own strength rather than yours, serving our interests rather than yours, and we ask your forgiveness. We thank you for your love that holds us constant and true, and Lord, we pray that you make of us a living sacrifice, one that is following and being conformed and transformed into the fullness of Christ continually. We lift up the one amongst us with the heaviest burden, Lord. We hold them up to you and thank you for your faithfulness. We bring our broken world to you, Lord. Our hearts can't even begin to comprehend the tragedy and the heartache, the pain and the loss that happens around our globe through famine and war, through greed and through abuse of power, sometimes through misplaced understandings of what it means to serve you and follow you. And we pray that there would be a revival and there would be a turning, that there would be an outpouring of your spirit and that, Lord, it would be, begin in each one of us. And we pray that our world would be changed. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And they all said, amen. amen.